My name is Steve Leiker. I'm a resident artist at RPAC in Ridgefield, Connecticut. We have studios um, off Main Street and we have a gallery right on Main Street in Ridgefield. Um, I'm happy to be here today to, to tell you about my process for constructing and composing my paintings. And I'm taking one as an example that I just finished to kind of take you through the process. So I start out by doing um, a thumbnail sketch, thumbnail sketches on paper using a charcoal. Um, I sketch out various uh, compositions uh, using the subject matter that I've chosen. Typically I chose, choose a subject matter which I feel is going to be interesting to the viewer um, regardless of how I uh, artistically replicate it. Um, in this case, um, I chose um, a saxophone player, a jazz saxophone player, and um, I wanted to then render it onto, the, uh, onto a canvas. So how do you start? You start by doing some thumbnail sketches to see what is, how it's going to um, turn out. It's, they're quick sketches and you then uh, allows you to make some changes quickly on the fly without having to do it later once you've got, once you've put um, paint onto canvas. I then choose a canvas. I chose initially an 18 by 24 uh, canvas. Um, I re sketched out the um, rendering that I had come up with the saxophone player with the head up here and the saxophone, saxophone down here and some background um, be, uh, behind it. And um, once I had done that, I realized that the 18 by 24 would be too small. Considering the size of a saxophone, um, I just felt it would be better to um, represent it into a, onto a larger canvas. So I then went to a, um, 30, a 24 by 30, which is this end result. I'll show you that next. But um, I start by taking this, the uh, thumbnail sketch, applying it onto, the, onto a painted canvas. Uh, the most intimidating part about getting started when you're a painter is the uh, white canvas. So first thing I do is I put down some kind of neutral color onto the canvas, and then I've officially started, so I can't feel so intimidated because I've started. I then take charcoal and draw the, um, the rendering onto the uh, canvas. So um, the next step is to start the uh, painting. Um, so let me take you to the finished product, and I can tell you how I went about doing that. So this is the finish, the end result. Um, what I did was, um, it, it was a lot of fun in that it, uh, because he's a jazz player, this is taking place in a uh, uh, either jazz uh, studio or cafe or um, uh, some kind of a jazz club. Um, it has the benefit of having uh, various degrees of stage lighting of, of, uh, of different colors. So in this case, what I wanted to do was uh, I envisioned a blue and a pink um, light, lighting above him that would bounce off the saxophone player and produce different degrees of lighting. Um, my background is I got my degree in both physics and art. So it stimulates both the right side and the left side of my brain. Um, but I like to play with light, and uh, such a situation allows me to play with both direct light, mixed light, shadows, um, bound, light that's bounced off different things, and uh, to uh, then impart it upon the, the uh, paint my painting. 
So in this case, the way I constructed it was to have some the lights, some lights as the background, to have the main um, saxophone player, and to have a background player. Um, the the way I initially set it up is that, uh, I use the one third rule, which the one third rule is you don't want to have your highlighted um, object or feature object right in the cent dead center of the canvas. That's a no-no. So what you want to do is you want to have it, if you do the one-third rule, you draw lines one-third of the way uh, vertically and one-third of the way horizontally, and you try to put things on those lines if possible to give it some, uh, point, some interest rather than a more boring, direct-centered um, object. Um, so I have his head somewhere around that intersection of the, of the one-third line. I have the main part of the saxophone on the one-third line. I have this second background object, the cellist, on the one-third line as well. So uh, I kind of followed that rule of, of thirds. Um, I wanted, then I had to decide what's going to be my object of focus, and I have two. One is the uh, saxophone player's face, and the other one is the saxophone itself, uh, focused on the lower part where a lot of the action of the saxophone is taking place. Um, what I did at that point, knowing that that was the focus, I want to make sure that the, the lighting, that the details and that um, other objects focus on uh, this area. So what I did was there are various arrows that lead right to the featured objects. For instance, I have all these arrows behind him leading to his head. I have these arrows here, these four, leading to his head. I have the saxophone leading to his head. Then I have a bunch of arrows leading to the saxophone itself. I have the elbow here of the cellist. I have the angled cello, cello uh, angle to him. I have the, his arms, his hands angled. I have the, uh, his shirt uh, shadowing angled towards the saxophone. So I wanted to have this, make sure the saxophone was, was focused uh, at a focal point, and I wanted to make sure that his head was a focal point. Um, I wanted to choose colors that were bright. Um, I wanted the um, painting to be kind of uh, realistic, but also impressionistic. So um, I, I wanted to kind of keep it loose. Um, the way I did that was I used rather larger brushes than I normally do. This is a, an 8 brush and this is a 12 brush. Uh, the, the brushes, because they're bigger, you know, you can't do really fine work with it. It's more loose, and I wanted to kind of keep it loose. Um, and when I have to do fine details, like the eyelashes, I just use uh, the side of the uh, brush rather than the full-on face of the brush. Um, I kept a rather simple palette. So this is my palette of colors. Um, I tend to use just paper plates as my actual palette. They're inexpensive. Um, I can readily get new ones, throw them out, and I'm not wasting uh, a more expensive palette. And it's easy, it holds everything pretty tenderly uh, for a holding. Um, I have about um, uh, nine colors, and that's all I have. I keep the palette kind of simple. Um, and that, and I try to keep this similar palette throughout my paintings. And what this does is it produces kind of uniformity from one painting to the other, since I'm using kind of equivalent paintings on each uh, paints on each one of my paintings. Um, so that's the, my paint selection. Um, I I made sure that uh, this cellist in the background balances out the larger saxophone player. So through perspective, I have this cellist in the back. 
Um, I have less detail on him because I don't want him to be the focus. I want him to just be a background to balance out my main uh, focus, which is the saxophone player. Um, because there is blue and pink lighting, I got to put some purples in there. I got to um, uh, really have fun with different colors on the facial area. Um, I got to have reflections of the pink and the uh, purples and blue on the saxophone, which was fun, on his hands, on his skin. So it really made for a fun um, painting and hopefully uh, something which is appealing to the, uh, to the viewer as he sees it. So that's, um, that ends my uh, presentation. I will be having uh, workshops this spring on composition and on various additional tips to uh, increase the appeal or value of your paintings. I hope to see you as a student in part of those workshops. Thank you very much.